This is CBC Here and Now. Panhandling is not something that's new. It's not something new for St. John's, nor is it something new for any major city across Canada or North America. It seems like you walk every 50 feet or so, there's somebody looking for some change. People are in hard times. They need to have some money to live. We call it a cycle of, of poverty that's linked to precarious housing. It's linked to chronic, difficult to manage mental illness. What's the impact of more panhandlers in downtown St. John's? Tonight, what business owners and others are trying to do to deal with the growing poverty. Well, heading outdoors this weekend and want to know which day is best? Well, Sunday is the fun day as long as you layer up your weekend weather details in just a couple of minutes. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. We start tonight looking at the impact of increased panhandling in downtown St. John's. Last night we told you about the problem that business owners are having with some of the people working the streets. And tonight we know more about a closed door meeting that happened at City Hall. Here now is Ryan Cook joins us live. So Ryan, what did we learn about this meeting? Well, we know that it was a meeting between the downtown St. John's group, City Council and the RNC, and we know that it was called by the business owners who wanted to know exactly what they can do about the situation down here. And the word is that they're looking at helping the panhandlers off the streets as opposed to forcing them out. We'll be uh, formalizing a working group and out reaching out to those other organizations that are working in our downtown community now and doing their own individual things. But I think if we can come together as one big group, and then provide a little more assistance to those individuals on the street. We can help curb the uh, panhandling. One of those organizations will probably be the gathering place. Executive Director Joanne Thompson says the increase in panhandlers is likely directly linked to the increasing number of people using the gathering place. Lately, they've been feeding 350 people every day for lunch. When they come here looking for help and we really sit and go through um, uh, the stories with them, you realize that there's a whole series of complex um, issues at hand and it is illness and it is addictions and very few people choose to live hungry and cold and on the streets. Since the spring started, it's been difficult to walk 50 feet downtown without encountering a panhandler and there have been some problems. We've had an instance uh, just recently where uh, two of them actually got into a, a fight in front of Yellow Belly and our customers actually got out and went out and broke up the fight. It's a, not all of them, but uh, for sure, without a doubt, there's probably, you know, over half of them that are, you know, that have more aggressive tactics. Now, Joanne Thompson says that it's the aggressive ones who are often the hardest to help, and the best way to curb the problem might be to put some, uh, some supports a little closer to the street. Clooney says one of the ideas that they're kicking around is bringing in workers who actually would help the panhandlers line up the best avenue to get support with the end goal of eliminating the need for panhandling. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Ryan Cook. Salmon anglers in the province won't be able to go fishing next Friday. The season was supposed to start on June 1st, but the licenses aren't ready. The province is in charge of printing the licenses, but blames the delay on DFO. But the fact remains, because of DFO's missteps, errors and omissions, as I have told everyone, regrettably, the license will not be available by the start of the season. And that is through no fault or no decision by the provincial government. It is caused because of the reality of the complicated printing initiative and tying that with a legally binding tag, retention tag, and other measures. One bright spot, though, when the licenses are printed, they'll cost $5 plus tax. And that's a drop from last year's price of $26. Nalcor Energy is warning people to beware of live wires as it moves closer to a historical moment. Here now is Terry Roberts joins us live now from our newsroom with the very latest. Terry. Uh, yeah, Anthony, well, after years of construction and billions of dollars of taxpayers' money, we now have uh, new transmission lines built from uh, Churchill Falls all the way to Soldiers Pond, a uh, total of about 1,600 kilometers, and that includes uh, a subsea power line under the Strait of Belle Isle. So that means we could see hydroelectricity flowing from Labrador to the island for the first time in July or August. And by late this year, homes, businesses and industry in Newfoundland could be energized 
by power from Churchill Falls. It's a milestone moment, but Nalcor is urging caution. Um, we believe it's in the public's uh, best interest or the best interest of safety that the public is aware that we're regularly or systematically energizing these assets. And we want to ensure that the public treats all of the assets on the transmission project as being live. This includes terminal stations in Churchill Falls, Muskrat Falls, Soldiers Pond, and of course the AC and DC transmission lines that stretch from Churchill Falls across the Strait of Belle Isle right to Soldiers Pond as well. So between two and 300 megawatts of recall electricity from Churchill Falls will be used to displace more expensive diesel power from Holyrood. Now Nalcor hopes to use the savings to help ease the pain for customers since rates are expected to double once Muskrat Falls comes online in two years. It's a very exciting time for the project team and for all the contractors working on the project. Um, this is the early stages of what will represent power ultim ultimately coming from Churchill Falls through the transmission line transmission system to St. John's. Uh, Nalcor says it hopes to save about uh, 175 million dollars over the next two years by importing this cheaper power from Churchill Falls and via the new uh, uh, maritime link to Nova Scotia and it hopes to use that money to help uh, mitigate uh, the new rates that are coming that's going to be a real rate shock for uh, for ratepayers in this province but critics say that's only a short-term solution and we can expect a big hit once the bills for Muskrat Falls start rolling in in about two years time reporting live from the newsroom I'm Terry Roberts for here and now all right, we saw Terry standing there. There's a window behind him about an hour ago. Some of the saucier brats in our office started singing Christmas carols. Oh. Because the <laughs> snow was gently falling oh, behind Terry. No. Yes. Yeah, there's going to be some of that uh, for some places uh, in Newfoundland and in Labrador tonight. Some flurries in the nighttime. Let's have a look at uh, what's in store for tonight. You can see, yes, some flurries here in central parts of uh, Newfoundland. And as well here in the east, it's going to be that messy mix of showers and flurries as well as in for uh, Western Labrador, Labrador City is going to see that mix as well overnight tonight and tomorrow. Yeah, it's, it's going to continue for some areas in Northern Peninsula. We're looking at first thing tomorrow morning. We're looking at a largely cloudy day in the east, but then you can see these showers moving in by Saturday afternoon as well as across Labrador here. So Saturday is going to be pretty drizzly. It's going to be a pretty gray and we're looking at more flurries coming in on Saturday night. So yeah, it's going to be drizzly in the day and then flurries in the nighttime. But as we move into Sunday, things are going to clear off very nicely. It's going to be cool though. Here's a quick look. You can see Saturday pretty much across the board. We're looking at some uh, drizzle and then on Sunday we're looking at a mix of sun and cloud for pretty much everybody. But yes, still very cool. I'll have more details a little later. Well, it's been a busy week for police on the province's highways. As part of Canada Road Safety Week, 4,000 vehicles were stopped and almost a quarter of those drivers were charged. Speeding was the biggest factor. More than 500 drivers were caught going over the limit. Aggressive driving offenses came second, with more than 70 tickets issued for that. And more than 30 tickets were issued for drivers not wearing their seat belts. RCMP say they'll be on the roads all summer as traffic increases, making sure drivers are staying safe. It seems a serial drunk driver from Paradise hasn't learned his lesson. Dennis Lawler was supposed to be sentenced this week, but he didn't show up for court. Tonight, there's a warrant out for Lawler's arrest. The former heavy equipment operator rolled his dump truck back in 2012. He was three times over the legal limit. He served 90 days in jail for that and two other crashes and lost his license for a year. But police again caught Lawler driving impaired twice, once in 2016 and again in 2017. If caught, the judge says the 44-year-old will likely land back in jail. Police in a Toronto suburb are hunting for a pair of suspects believed to have set off an explosion in a restaurant. Residents are still shaken up. It's devastating. It's traumatic in your own neighborhood, your own backyard where you work. You know, you don't, you're not, you don't know what, what is aware, what's out there, right? You don't know why there's people with very bad intentions and it's very sad to see. 
A bomb was detonated last night in a crowded dining room where several families were gathered, many with small children. At least 15 people were injured. All the victims are now out of hospital. Investigators have released a picture of the two suspects. At this point, the police don't believe hate or terror are factors in the blast. It's been seven months since dozens of women first spoke out about allegations of sexual misconduct involving Harvey Weinstein. Today, the disgraced Hollywood producer turned himself into New York City police. Harvey, are you sorry? Are you sorry, Harvey? That's the scene as it played out outside a Manhattan courtroom this morning. The 66-year-old former film mogul faces charges of rape and other sex crimes for alleged incidents involving two women. Weinstein's lawyers say his, their client intends to plead not guilty. He was released after posting $1 million in bail. He's also required to wear an electronic monitoring device. With legal weed coming on the market in just a few weeks, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians don't seem too excited about buying it. That's according to a new poll from MQO Research. Only 22% of the 400 people interviewed said they'd consider buying cannabis when it's legal. That lines up pretty closely to other Atlantic provinces. People under 55 uh, and living in the St. John's area are most likely to buy. The poll was conducted by phone over two weeks and has a plus or minus 4.9% margin of error 19 times out of 20. If there's tension between the Medical Association and the provincial government, the province's health minister says, well, that's news to him. John Hagee says he was surprised to hear that a group of family doctors within the NLMA are tired of being disrespected by the government. The group said it had hoped their relationship with Hagee would be a good one because he's a former surgeon. While Hagee says they don't always agree on issues, a meeting that he attended with doctors on Wednesday was positive. I was actually quite surprised. I mean, I always felt we'd had a very cordial relationship uh, for the entire three years since I took the mandate on. So I was a bit surprised and, and, and kind of worried about the comments that came out there. We don't always agree. I mean, there's going to be policy direction uh, and, and initiatives that government might want uh, to, to move ahead with, which the NLMA may not. But I mean, that's the same with the nurses, the RNU uh, and other professional advocacy groups. Today is grad day for students at Lewisport Collegiate, and one student has worked especially hard to show up in style. Mm -hmm. Jake Hollett has spent almost four years working on his ride, and it's a ride with a lot of significance for his family. Here now is Garrett Barry put together this story for you. The truck is a 69 Dodge D200 Camper Special Custom, which means that from the factory we came with a sliding camper in the pan. It was just a white truck and it was partially covered in with a blue tarp. It was sunk up to the axles in mud. It was just, I seen the truck and there's a feeling, I just had a feeling that that was the truck that I wanted to do. Really I started with the idea that I was just going to fix the brakes and drive the truck as it was because that's all the truck needed. Well, I put it in the garage and I started to tear the, the truck apart and I just didn't stop until there's nothing left to the truck. Oh my goodness, there's countless times I'd, I'd leave the garage and slam the door and, and say that I'd never touch the truck again, but I always ended up coming back down. And for the first ride, I took my great-grandmother. She didn't know the truck was anywhere near completion. And my parents drove down to kind of distract her as I drove up. And when she turned around, she there's... There's no emotion on her face just because she didn't know what to, what to do, whether to cry or to laugh. Uh, it brought back a lot of memories, and when I went to put the seat belt on, I said, oh my. That was my, my main goal, was to take her for a ride first. Before me, my great-grandfather owned it. Yeah. He and his dad came, and uh, I said, uh, you must want something. And they looked at me and laughed. And I said, well, the two of us are together, so you must need something. I told him, yes, he could have it with a heart and a half. I love this boy. Doing the truck makes me feel like I'm, I have a connection to him that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And when I sit in the truck, I just feel like he's here with me, sat, sat beside me. We enjoyed her, and we 
we was wherever he went, I went, and and when he came and got me, and we went for a drive, it brought back a lot of beautiful memories. Yeah, and I'm so thankful to him that he did what he did with the truck, and and he's a precious boy, and I think he'll go far. What a lovely what a great story. story. <laughs> wow, a lot of work too. Oh my yeah. goodness, four years. Mm -hmm. So as we said, grad day in Lewisport and it looks like Jake had a pretty gorgeous date. Mm -hmm. That's right, just take a look at this picture that uh, he sent along. There it is, <laughs> wow. And look, his, it's as if his outfit actually matches the truck too. That's just fantastic. Congratulations, Jake, on graduating mm -hmm. and on your project. Yeah. Great style. Collaborative Healthcare in Cornerbrook. Everything you need, your family physician, your physio, your acupuncture, even your yoga, all under one roof. And the people that run these healthcare centers say it's changing healthcare in this town.
Continuing with our critical condition series and our ongoing discussions about the province's health care system, a look now at a new approach to health care on the West Coast. Two collaborative health care centers in Cornerbrook offer pretty much every type of treatment that you could possibly need, and it's all under one roof. Here now's Colleen Connors explains just what goes on at these health hubs. So on our main floor, we have a four-member family medicine practice. We have orthopedic surgeons, our pharmacy, and our rehab or allied health section. So within that, the list of services is endless. There's even a yoga studio. I wanted to have a place that people felt good. As soon as they walked in the door, I wanted it to feel different for people. Vich is a physiotherapist who wanted to bring family doctors into her practice in 2012. It's now grown into this huge health center. She knew it was working when different professionals started discussing patient treatment options around the water cooler. And I overheard a really quick conversation between one of the family docs and one of our physios. Hey, like I've got, you know, this client and I'm not sure what I should do. And they went, oh, okay, well, this is what I'm doing. And I was like, that is exactly, exactly what I wanted. The same collaborative approach to health care is happening here. Heather Buckle is a physiotherapist who brought doctors and specialists under the same roof. We saw that the collaborative care model worked really well. Uh, when the team members were talking regularly, the patient care improved, um, patient happiness improved, uh, even the ease of our workday and our productivity improved. The best part? These beautiful facilities attract new doctors, something Cornerbrook desperately needs. So our big goal was to try and create better opportunities for family doctors to move to Cornerbrook and say, look what we have. We have a beautiful medical center, and there's a lot of docs that are graduating now that want to be in a center like this, but just don't want to start it themselves. And it's changed basically everything about how we operate. Smallwood thinks the center provides primary health care while helping public health. Well, the hospital is really busting and overwhelmed with things. What this building can do is provide a place where people can see their family doctor, they can see a specialist. I mean, in this building we've got gynecology, we've got general surgery, we've got orthopedics, um, which is a big catchment for a lot of the issues that people have. New physicians set up a family practice in the centers while also working in the hospital emergency rooms. It seems that the collaborative healthcare approach is working here, and the people that run these large health centers say there's still room to grow. Both buildings have space available for more doctors and specialists to come and set up shop here. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. So fat pork with some onions, and uh, I think the pastry too is something that everybody likes to eat. Flippers flying off the shelves. How the Wesley United Church tries to keep up with demand for its flipper dinners.
CBCNL will join Shalloway Youth Choir in celebrating 25 years with Our Culture Sings Gala on Friday, June 1st. Hosted by Tom Power, the event will include an evening of fabulous performances with dinner by Todd Perrin and the Mallard Cottage crew. For more information, check out the CBCNL community page. Well, I'm sure many of you, like many of us, were kind of surprised to have a bit of snow on our roofs here in St. John's, but of course nothing like what happened in Central. Amazing. <laughs> what a shock to the system to have 36 <laughs> centimeters of snow there, there yesterday. The garden center. So this is what they got today in Gander. It still was relentless. Uh, May 25th, eh? Yeah, certainly not as heavy as it was uh, the day before, but, you know, continuing flurries again tonight. Not a huge amount, only about two centimeters uh, expected overnight, but still it's... Uh, it's Still yep. <laughs> hardy, hardy vegetation of the garden center in Gander. Let's let's hope. Yeah, absolutely. So much snow. Well, I wanted to show you uh, one person who's really enjoying the snow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just love this picture. That's a little a Griffin Green in Gander, and he's making the most of it for sure, building his uh, cartwheeling snowman, legs and all, with rubber boots on. Uh -huh. Pretty happy. It's a dandy. <laughs> Just love that picture. So thank you very much, Whitney Green, for sending that in. All right, so let's get to our weather on the way details for the weekend. Overnight flurries tonight and uh, tomorrow night. So looking forward to that. We're looking at a drizzly uh, Saturday for much of the island tomorrow, but things are then going to clear off on Sunday. But we're looking at very cool temperatures over the weekend. And this is the situation right now. You can see some of the, the showers across the island right now. And also that mix of snow flurries and, uh, and showers kind of mixing together there along the Avalon Peninsula here and in the West Coast. So yeah, it's a bit messy and it's going to stay that way overnight tonight. You can see that it's going to change to more of a steady flurry action there in uh, central areas moving up towards the Gander area. Labrador City can expect some flurries as well overnight tonight so showers for much of the island but depending on the temperature uh, at the time it will kind of determine whether or not you get showers or flurries uh, so Grand Falls winds are looking at that sort of situation tonight fairly strong winds southeast winds 40 to 60 and uh, as well that messy mix in uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay overnight tonight so tomorrow those flurries will start to uh, clear away a bit but we are looking at some drizzle for a while, we'll see a bit of a cloudy day, but then as we get into Saturday afternoon, those showers are going to uh, become a bit more intense as well as across Labrador there. But you can see still that mix as we get later in the evening between flurries and showers. So. Yeah, that's what uh, we're looking at tomorrow evening. Tomorrow daytime, this is the picture. Temperatures fairly cold, not too bad in St. John's at 8 degrees, uh, but the rest of the island looking at cooler temperatures. Grand Falls winds are 6 degrees there, but showers pretty much across the board. Chance of showers in Makovic tomorrow, 4 degrees. And again, a uh, chance of those flurries in western Labrador tomorrow. So Saturday night, we're going to see more of those flurries move in in the Gander area badger area uh, along the northeast coast there and then as we get into sunday you can see how things just sort of clear away which is fantastic it's going to be a lovely bright sunday but uh, the temperatures aren't going to be so great we're looking at uh, single digit temperatures for most places i'll have those details a little later thanks carolyn a St. John's institution says he can barely keep up with the demand for seal flipper dinners. The Wesley United Church has bought 750 flippers so far this year. Already it's sold out two events and tickets for a third dinner are getting pretty scarce. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Seal flippers. They're not for everyone, but the people who love to eat them really love them. And for them, Wesley United Church is one of the few places to get this in St. John's. When we sell out each one, we'll have 165 people here tonight. Church fundraiser Marvin Barnes says selling tickets for these has never been a problem. Can't miss. We can have 10 flipper dinners, I think, and sell them out. People love them. <laughs> in Wesley United's kitchen, it's a precise military operation. And Phoebe Shepherd, who's been preparing flipper dinners for three decades, is one of the church's secret weapons. 
you need lots of fat pork with them, onions, and uh, I think the pastry too is something that everybody likes to have with flipper. Shepard definitely knows how to cook seal, but that doesn't mean she'll be pulling up a chair when it's served. No, I don't like it. You don't like it? No, I don't like it, although <laughs> I prepare it. And, I, and I've been doing it for years, but I don't like flipper. So you don't eat it at all? No. Some people like them, but they don't like to cook them whole. So this is the place to come. <laughs> it's hard labor for volunteers, peeling and cutting potatoes, turnips and carrots. Gus Dillon is one of the recruits. Uh, like all churches in the city, the attendance is dropping. So this is one of the ways that we raise money for the church. This is a really great meal. This is a really good meal here at Westwood Church. As you can see, the, the people in the kitchen here do a fantastic job. But for Flipper fans, time is running out. Wesley United Church's last dinner of this year will be held on June 7th. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. What's unique about these three is they were in three different militaries. They died in three different battles and none of them have been known great. An important piece of history will be restored tomorrow in Pooch Cove. The story of Horatio, Uriah and James Baldwin next on Here and Now. Oh, boys, open your eyes. There's no need for a four-year wait for anybody. What happens when your healthcare system needs triage? Join CBC for a public forum on fixing Newfoundland and Labrador's healthcare system. Share your stories and solutions. Thursday from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at Munn's Bruno Center. You can also watch live on Here and Now or at CBC NL's Facebook page. More details at cbc.ca slash nl. It has languished for years in a cemetery in Pooch Cove, but tomorrow this important piece of history will be restored. The old headstone to remember Edward Baldwin, who died in 1928, lies in pieces. The names of his three sons killed in World War I etched in the stone as well. Now a new headstone will take its place in a ceremony tomorrow. Michael Pretty chairs the Trail of the Caribou Research Group, which spearheaded the project. So Michael, here is the site of the mm -hmm. original headstone and uh, 
Edward and his son's names are engraved here. What can you tell me about these Baldwins? Well, the, well we found the headstone right here in five pieces. Edward was a fisherman from Pooch Cove, who uh, that's how he made his living, and he had seven sons and three daughters. His first son, James, uh, that's listed on the, on the stone, he was in the U.S. military at the outbreak of the First World War, and he got out of the U.S. military, went to England, and joined the British Army. Um, the second one listed is Uriah, and he joined the Newfoundland Regiment because he was also a fisherman from here. And the last one, Horatio, was an elevator man in Montreal, so he joined the Canadian Army. And that was typical of Newfoundlanders from wherever they were around the world when the First World War started, whether it was the U.S. or Canada or South Africa or Australia or England, they joined the local military or the local army and went to fight. Now their names are here, the boys' names are here, but they're not buried here. No, no, what's, it's... What's the story? So it, this is a common thing in Newfoundland. There's another couple in the cemetery that did the same thing. So when the, the father or the mother of the family died, they would remember their, lo their lost ones on, on their cenotaphs, or churches would do it on a cenotaph in a graveyard. And of course, every town has a war memorial. What's unique about these three is they were in three different militaries, they died in three different battles, and none of them have a known grave. Hmm. If, you have a no, if you don't have a known grave, you go on a memorial. One's on the wall of Beaumont Hamel, and the other two are on the wall of the Menin Gate. And their first cousin is on the Vimy Ridge Monument because he died and he's put on the Canadian Monument of Vimy Ridge. Michael, this is a project of your um, Trail of the Caribou Research Group. I know you have a military background, yep. 33 years, you've finished up in Bosnia. What motivates you to, to restore headstones like the one that will be um, revealed to the community tomorrow? Um, I, I love history, and I think we need to remember those who came before us, and especially people like, like this who have, who have sacrificed so much. Um, so. In, in all the different things I've done in the military, in 2006, I was put in, in uh, the planning officer for the pilgrimage back to France and Flanders. And I noticed all the beautiful headstones that the Commonwealth War Graves keep up. And I came home and I found some graves here of, of soldiers that came home. And then I started finding these. And some of them are, are very beaten up and some of them can be restored. And some of them we find like this, are just, they're just not salvageable. So, there's no group that does this, right? The Commonwealth War Graves have a job. The Last Post Fund has a job. So this is going to be our job. And it, it's not just this. It's, it's those memorials that are in, in Senate cemeteries that just list the people from that town that didn't come home. It's, um, it's education. You know, uh, we do a lot of talks at schools uh, where we go in and we talk about what happened in the war or, or why. And the younger the grade, the more interactive it becomes. We, taught, we, we bring in uh, replica helmets and gas masks and the kids play with that. And we, we teach them about why it's important to remember that people like this were willing to do what they did. Tomorrow at uh, the ceremony, the small yep. ceremony you're having here, will there be any relatives uh, of the Baldwins here to see this? Uh, yes, there will be uh, one, one fellow. And he is a distant, distant relation to uh, to the brother of Edward. And uh, we do know that Walter Baldwin, who was one of the ones that came home, seven Baldwins went to war, two came home, five were killed. Uh, plus there's another Baldwin from the West Coast, Gilbert, who was killed. Um, so they will, he will, uh, and the, the, the local lady in charge of the women's church group will lay a, a bouquet of flowers. And their first cousins, or their great-grandchildren of Walter Baldwin that live in Florida are aware of what we're doing. Hmm. Yeah. It's hard to find them because there were so many of them were killed and moved away. Yeah. So Michael, um, there are many more projects that you have ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much for telling us about this one and uh, I hope the ceremony goes well tomorrow. Thank you. So this uh, research group, I gather, they obviously must have other projects sort of in their sights? They certainly do. Uh, Michael was saying the group's recently received uh, charitable status. They hope to be able to make, uh, take on many other projects. They've already identified a number of them around the island. And by the way, tomorrow's ceremony in Puchkov is at noon.
Currently, the mortality rate is really high. About 40 to 75 percent of people that are infected with this virus will die. It's being called the worst virus you've never heard of. Coming up, we'll talk about the Nipah virus and how it can damage the human brain. Time to meet our young athlete of the day. This is Ian Fraser of St. John's. He's eight and is a member of the Avalon Karate Club. He is a 2018 Provincial Karate Championship medalist with two gold medals, thank you very much, as well as a 2017-2018 Atlantic Karate Championship medalist with a gold and a bronze. Ian also plays on the St. John's Soccer Club Under 10 team, his school's grade three basketball team, and takes swimming lessons. Congratulations. Busy boy. He certainly <laughs> is, yeah. Now, no. Carolyn has got something to show us, which is not very nice. <laughs> yeah, well, I just thought I would start with comparing our temperature to some other places in Canada because it is just so stark. Let's just have a look here. So right now, this is the temperature right now. St. John's, 2 degrees. Toronto, 30. Montreal 25, Lab City 5. So thank you, Northerly Flow, for this uh, very uh, big difference in temperature for sure. Now, overnight tonight, we are looking at uh, some uh, showers to mix in with those cold temperatures, as well as some flurries for parts of central uh, Newfoundland, as well as the West Coast, or <laughs> Western Labrador, rather, Labrador City, looking at some uh, flurries overnight tonight. And uh, into tomorrow, Saturday, we're looking at some uh, some showers throughout the day uh, in St. John's. Sometime in the afternoon, we should start seeing those showers. So temperatures staying fairly cool. Eight degrees as the high tomorrow in St. John's. Grand Falls winds are getting up to six degrees. So it'll be a cool, damp, 
gray cloudy day tomorrow and in Labrador some more flurries for Lab City there and along the coast Nain looking at a mix of sun and cloud and three degrees so Saturday evening more flurries uh, for some areas and in, then into Sunday we're looking at uh, a nice clearing that's coming uh, winds picking up a bit here in the east it looks like 80 kilometers gusts there uh, for uh, St. John so it might be windy but at least it'll be a uh, nice and clear uh, for most of the day. We are looking at cooler temperatures uh, in the east, sun and cloud, five degrees, a little bit warmer on the west coast, 12 degrees there, and not bad for Labrador, hey? Some double digits there for them and some mix of sun and cloud. So Sunday night uh, into Monday, we're looking at a very similar story as you start your work week, but you can see this system that's sort of edging closer and closer to Labrador. But Monday is looking pretty good, very similar to Sunday. Temperatures slightly warmer, 15 degrees sun and cloud on the west coast, 9 degrees in western Labrador, just 8 uh, in St. John. So Sunday and Monday looking pretty similar, but then we have the system that's moving across Labrador, bringing some showers and uh, as well to the island by Tuesday afternoon. So that's going to be the next system that uh, we'll see as we begin the week next week, and then it should start to move off on Wednesday evening and into Thursday afternoon. So this is the picture for the next seven days. You can see we're looking at a couple of days of uh, showers there and then perhaps some clearing by the end of the week on Friday and uh, Labrador as well, looking at some double digit temperatures there on Wednesday and Thursday and uh, rounding it off on Friday with a mix of sun and cloud and around eight degrees. Steffi. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, some are calling it the worst disease no one has ever heard of. Nipah is a rare virus that damages the brain. In the last week, it's killed at least 10 people in India, including a nurse. And as Christine Birak tells us, scientists here in Canada say they are worried. As stories emerge of villagers in Kerala dying of a rare brain damaging disease, panic over Nipah virus is spreading across southern India. For those who live through SARS in Toronto, some of these images will look familiar. People walking around with their faces covered, afraid they'll catch the mysterious virus. Here's what we know. Nipah is carried by fruit bats and it's spread through infected saliva, feces and urine. Dr. Isaac Bogosh treats infectious diseases at Toronto General Hospital. This virus certainly causes an, uh, a, a, a really nasty syndrome with inflammation of the brain. Uh, certainly the mortality rate is really high. About 40 to 75 percent of people that are infected with this virus will die and people that, are, that survive are often left with uh, permanent deficits afterwards. The virus was first discovered in 1998 in the village of Nipah in Malaysia, where it went from bats to pigs to humans, killing 105 people. It's believed the first victims in India were drinking water from a well contaminated by dead fruit bats. A nurse caring for the sick village has also died. It is definitely concern. Officials often say health threats are just a plane ride away, but keep in mind, this outbreak is still small. Nipah virus is being studied here in Canada at the National Center for Foreign Animal Disease in Winnipeg. Dr. Hannah Weisgardel is testing it in pigs. The work actually started after 9-11, so there were concerns about bioterrorism and uh, this was one of the agents which uh, could be potentially used as a bioterrorist agent. So we uh, started to work on that. Much to her dismay, no drug maker is currently pursuing a Nipah vaccine, citing it's just not profitable. While the virus is extremely rare and no travel advisory has been issued, beaches in Kerala are now emptying out. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Canada's Navy has been undertaking a dangerous international mission. Divers from Halifax are finding mines from the Second World War at the bottom of the Baltic Sea, and then they blow them up. CBC's Brett Ruskin has the details. Well, this team of specialized Navy experts from the Fleet Diving Unit based here in Halifax, as well as on the West Coast, are right now overseas conducting this mission to try to get rid of World War I and World War II underwater mines. Now, they are specifically in the Baltic Sea near Muhu Island, which is in Estonia, and they've been working to identify these underwater mines, swim down, attach explosives to them, swim away quickly, hop back in the boat, and then detonate them. Here is how that looks and sounds. Big wave. Three, two, one. Whoa! <laughs> 
And so again, they've been doing this mission annually because there are so many mines that were deployed during World War II that they are still uh, working their way through them as more are discovered. They work with a number of other nations to do this somewhat risky mission. Now, the commanders say that it is uh, all the risks are managed because, again, these are highly trained divers specialized in their field and the risks that they are eliminating by getting rid of these mines uh, greatly outweigh uh, the risks to the divers themselves. And so uh, they are doing this mission this year. They will likely be back again next year because there are thousands of mines still there in the Baltic Sea in that region of the world dating back decades. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. A landmark referendum on a highly polarizing issue is taking place in Ireland. Voters in the once deeply Catholic country are being asked whether to end the strict ban on abortion. The CBC's Nala Ayed reports. We're talking about 3.2 million people who are eligible to vote in stations like this one here. And for many of them, it is a very important issue. And that's because Ireland is the last Western democracy where an effective ban on abortion is still enshrined in its national laws. Now, for those who are voting, yes, uh, this isn't only an issue of, about bringing Ireland in line with the rest of the Western world, but also in bringing it in line with reality, because we're told that an average of nine women a day have to travel outside this country to get abortion services and that three, an estimated three women per day uh, are taking pills illegally to induce abortion. Uh, we spoke to one woman who has had to travel because of an unwanted pregnancy to the Netherlands. Her name is Tara Flynn and she's an actor and comedian. Here's a little bit of what she told us. As much as they might not like the idea of it, abortion's already here. People are taking pills that they order online even though it's against the law. When people are in pain or desperate, they will do what they need to do and you know they're so determined they're so certain of their decision that they'll travel for the health care they need they'll travel for an abortion they'll get one here they'll take matters into their own hands and that's not safe and we're going to try and make people safe and i hope there are enough of us tomorrow that that, that will happen now, if there is a no vote, then nothing changes. And that, that was one of the arguments that the government advanced for voting yes. It said that this is a once in a generation opportunity to make change. If the answer is yes, then the government already has a pretty detailed proposal on the books where it suggests that abortions could be allowed for any reason for up to 12 weeks and beyond that until the full term of pregnancy, if there's a risk to the mother's health or if uh, the, the fetus has a condition that uh, could lead to death. Of course, the no campaigners believe that this is a very extreme proposal. And we spoke to one of them who speaks on behalf of Love Both. Her name is Geraldine Martin. Here's a little bit of what she had to say. I suppose I always remember, for example, working during my student days in the neonatal intensive care unit of one of the maternity hospitals. And I remember, for example, the tiniest babies that were in that unit surrounded by amazing amounts of technology and huge staff expertise and yet this proposal to, we, we, we would have put all our effort into saving those babies lives but yet we're talking here about a proposal that's aiming to deliberately end lives and you know it just doesn't weigh up when you've trained when you've worked in the area of saving life abortion is life ending it is never life saving the counting starts tomorrow morning and we're expecting that the matter will be settled before the end of the day Nala Yed, CBC News, Dublin. To breaking news now, striking IOC wor uh, steel workers in Labrador City are feeling optimistic tonight. On their Facebook page, United Steel Workers 5795 say their negotiating committee has reached a tentative agreement with the Iron Ore Company of Canada. Workers have been on strike in Labrador City since late March. There will be a membership meeting at the arena in Labrador City tomorrow at noon. Well, here's today's viewer picture of the day, a stunning sunset somewhere in the province. All that light reflecting off the snow. Any ideas where this could be? Hint, island or Labrador, come on. It's off the <laughs> island. Labrador. Oh, okay, yeah. gorgeous. <laughs> well, that Thanks. narrows it down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>
Welcome back, everyone. We want to show you some absolutely wild video captured by a wildlife photographer in Washington. A fox carrying a recently caught rabbit, wait for it, battling out Whoa. with a bald eagle for supper supremacy. Wow. So the furry one puts up the best fight that he can. I mean, there you go, flying with the eagle, but it's the snatch and grab eagle that flies away with the prize. Take a look. There's the fox with the bunny. The photographer says the fox, oh. look at the power. Uh, the fox is actually fine. Uh, the rabbit, uh, not so much. Oh, well, somebody yeah. has to win. Here's something where everyone does win. People celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Have a look. Derek and Diane Williams celebrate 50 years of marriage today. Tomorrow, it's happy 90th birthday to Ben Robbins in Hatchet Cove. Joe and Olive Keogh and Bay Roberts celebrated their 51st wedding anniversary this week. Happy 54th anniversary today to Lawrence and Margaret Peckford. Big birthday greetings to Marjorie Smith in Hodges Cove, who turned 96 today. Gertie March in Clarenville will celebrate her 98th birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday. Yesterday, Ronald Warford celebrated his 90th birthday in Grand Falls, Windsor. Ronald's originally from Pleasant View. A happy 92nd birthday today to Francis Hurley in Badger. And a happy 50th anniversary to Junior and Mabel Burry in New West Valley. Their big day was yesterday. A happy 65th anniversary to Roy and Olive Sansom in St. John's who celebrated their big day on Wednesday. Happy 91st birthday to Ray Hindi. Ray is from Winterton. On Wednesday, Goldie and Harold Ryan from Red Bay, Labrador celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Happy 51st anniversary to George and Doreen Hooper from Buren. Happy 92nd birthday to Bert Keats in Musgrave Town. Happy birthday this Sunday to Harold Johnston from Ghouls. He will celebrate his 91st birthday. Happy 97th birthday today to Orpa Hewlin from Robinsons. Also today, happy 95th birthday to Evangeline Payne in Cornerbrook. Birthday greetings this coming Monday to Donald Swires, who will celebrate his 94th birthday. Donald is from Botwood and now lives in Lewisport. Happy 50th wedding anniversary today to Gerald and Geraldine Mercer in Swift Current. Tomorrow, Manuel and Lily Barney in Lancelou celebrate their 63rd wedding anniversary. Congratulations. And a happy anniversary yesterday to John and Linda Keeping, who celebrated their 53 years together. John and Linda are from Burnt Islands. A happy 61st wedding anniversary uh, to Jim and Yvonne Saunders from Norris Arm. And happy 51st wedding anniversary greetings to Walter and Eileen LeDrew from Traytown, Bonavista Bay. And a happy 50th wedding anniversary to Frank and Norma Rose, who celebrated their big day yesterday. Quick. We gotta go. Yes, it's here's McCovic. our viewer picture. <laughs> Taking in the Kovic. Thank you, Robert Anderson.